Uh, first chapter dealing with electric forces and fields. Second chapter is going to deal with potential and kind of electrical energy as well as capacitors and capacitance. So starting with electric forces and fields, we've got to talk about charge. So I'm not going to ask you what charge is, but I'm going to ask you how it behaves. So first of all, how many types of charges are there? Two. What do we call them? Positive, negative. And we say that likes repel, repel and <laughs> opposites attract, right? So that is the key here. Boy, we're in, you've been in school three weeks now. <laughs> Sweet. Uh, so charge, you notice that the SI unit for length is meters and the SI unit for time is seconds. What's the SI unit for charge? Coulombs. Coulombs. And something you should know about Coulombs is that it's a huge unit for charge. So the likelihood of you ever seeing something that has a one Coulomb charge is not likely. So most of the problems you'll see in a typical physics problem, take that into account. And you'll see like maybe micro Coulombs or maybe even nano Coulombs are much more likely charges for you to see. Now, where does charge come from on like on a subatomic level? What in the universe has charge? Electrons and protons. Electrons and protons. So when we're talking about electricity and stuff like that and charges moving around in the metal, which charges are the actual mobile ones? the electrons. So, and if you look, that's the fundamental charge and everything that has a charge is because it either has some excess of electrons or some lack of electrons. And so we can always look at a charge as being some multiple of the charge on an electron. It turns out the charge on an electron is 1.602 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. And so if you had 10 excess electrons, what charge would that object have if it had 10 excess electrons? So, uh, how about 1.602 times 10 to the negative 18 coulombs? But yeah. So, let's multiply this guy by 10. So, if you had an extra million 10 to the sixth electrons, then multiply this by 10 to the sixth, and you end up with 1.602 times 10 to the negative 13 coulombs. So, but everything in the universe, if it's charged, that charge will always work out to be some multiple of this. And that was Millikan's famous oil drop experiment that he used with a charged drop of oil, and he figured out roughly what charge an electron actually had from that. All right, um, let's talk about conductors and insulators. What's a conductor? Metal. So, well, in metal's an example, but what does it mean to say that it's a conductor? Um, separates the charges. Not so much separates the charges, but charges are able to move freely throughout it. So, whereas an insulator, charges aren't able to move freely throughout it. So, and the big difference here, let's say that Chris is an insulator. So, and if I'm charged, I can pass a charge onto him, and one way we might do that is called charge by conduction. And charge by conduction means I actually have to come in contact, the two objects actually, actually come in contact to actually transfer charge. And so if Chris is an insulator, if I touch his head, then his head might become charged in some way, shape, or form, either positive or negative, depending on what I am and stuff. So, but it's not gonna spread out throughout his body. Whereas if Joseph, if you're a conductor, if I touch your head, and give you some sort of charge, that charge will uniformly spread across the surface of your entire body because you're a conductor now and charges can move about freely. So that's one big difference between conductors and insulators is when they become charged, what does that actually look like? So, cool, so we've talked about charge by conduction. Question? Okay, if you're 10 coulombs of charge and you touch him, <laughs> are you, does he have five coulombs of charge on the top of his head and then you touch me and I have five throughout my whole body? So, like possibly, possibly. So, in fact, we're going to do a problem here dealing with charge by conduction and stuff like that. So, but if your conductor is easy, okay, with two conductors, if I have 10 coulombs of charge and you're not charged and I come into contact with you, so, and I let go, the charge spreads evenly between us, and so now we both have five coulombs of charge. Okay. And it'd be spread uniformly across the surface of your body, as we'd find out. Cool. So, that's charging by conduction, but there's also charging by induction. So I am currently touching something that has an infinite reservoir of electrons or an infinite way to either flow electrons towards it or take electrons from it. So it's an infinite reservoir. We call that the ground. And so when something's connected to the ground, it doesn't have to actually be the physical ground. So, but we say that it is grounded. And so it has access to an infinite reservoir of electrons or it has access to an infinite place to put electrons. And so charging by in, I'm sorry, charging by uh, induction works by having an object that is grounded. So let's say that Joseph, now you're grounded. And again, I have a charge. And let's just say I'm positively charged. So as I come near you, so you might get, you know, polarized in some way, shape or form if you weren't touching the ground. But because you're touching the ground, I'm not touching you, but I'm near you. 
And so I'm positive, so what would you like to be? Negative. Negative. So guess what you're going to get from the ground? More electrons. More electrons. So, and then I'm going to take, and you're going to get disconnected from the ground, and then I'm going to leave. But you get to keep those electrons because you're no longer connected to the ground. And that would be charged by induction in this case. I never actually came into contact with you, but because you're connected to the ground, we can have the passage of electrons to or from the ground to you and you get the opposite charge. Cool, that's just charging by induction. So if you look at question number one on your handout, we've got two rods here. So one with a negative 10 microcoulomb charge and one with a positive 16 microcoulomb charge. And we're gonna look at charging by conduction. So actually put these in contact. Question says, if the following two conducting rods are brought into contact, what charge will remain on them? Now in the example we did, Joseph, I had all the charge, you had none, and it spread out evenly between us. Well, it's still gonna spread out evenly between these rods, except they both have a charge in this case. So how do I figure out how much charge they both end up with? Just add up their total charge and divide it by two. So what total charge is present on both rods combined? Six microcoulombs. Positive six microcoulombs. And so in the end, how much charge will each of them have? Good. Put them in contact, let it long enough for it to equilibrate, pull them back apart, and now they've both got positive three microcoulombs of charge.